Hi, I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson, and you're watching Get Your Sax Together, the home of free online saxophone lessons. Now, what about that second chord in Take the A Train, or the second chord in Girl from Epidema? If you know your stuff, you'll know that that chord is called a secondary dominant, and if you've ever wondered what to do when you're improvising, when you get to that chord, or any secondary dominant chord when you're improvising, you're about to find out today, because I'm gonna clear it all up. Let's do this. Just before we get into today's lesson, make sure you grab the free PDF cheat sheet for today's lesson. Use the link that you can see there or click the link in the description. It's got all the main points from today's lesson as well as the six musical examples transcribed at the end from Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, and Sonny Stitt. Great players. So make sure you grab that resource. We're going to go on to the lesson now. This is more for intermediate players this week. So if you're a complete beginner, I'm about to tell you all the stuff that you can look at to get up to speed on this theory and harmony that you need to know when you're going to improvise, not just in secondary dominance, but on any chord sequence. Just before we get straight into it though, I forgot to mention about the Saxophone Success Masterclass. Check out the link there. This is a free one hour free class. It's absolutely gonna cost you nothing at all. You just fill in your email and it takes you through a whole range of saxophone stuff which is gonna instantly improve your playing, your practice, your tone, uh, your improvising, and there's a load of other really cool saxophone licks and tricks. So grab that free resource and without further ado, Let's get into today's really juicy lesson on improvising over jazz harmony. Here we go. First of all, this lesson is for people who already know what the notes of chords are and have a basic grasp of functional harmony. If this isn't you, or if it is you, but you need to refresh your memory, go to the playlist linked above now. That's a zero to hero crash course in harmony that takes you from literally zero knowledge of theory in harmony through to pretty advo advanced voice leading and all that kind of stuff. Even if you know your chords, you should also check out my lesson on the modes linked up there. After all that, you can come back here and start getting into this advanced malarkey about Lydian dominance and all that fun stuff. Okay, all that said, here we go. First things first, if we're talking about secondary dominance, we better make sure we know what dominance are. <laughs> all this stuff is covered in the resources I just mentioned, but in a nutshell, a dominant chord is a tension chord that pulls back to a tonic chord or a home chord. The dominant is the chord built on the fifth scale degree of the key. For example, in the key of C, the dominant is G7. One, two, three, four, five, takes us to G. So G7 is the dominant, and it wants to pull back to C like this. So far, so good. Now let's talk about secondary dominance. A secondary dominant is the five chord of any diatonic chord from the key you're in. So if you build seventh chords on each of the scale degrees of a key, say C major, using only the notes found in the home major scale, you get seven different chords. In this case, they're C major seven, D minor seven, E minor seven, F major seven, G seven, A minor seven, and B half diminished. Seven different chords diatonically within each key, within each major scale. You can now add a five chord of each of those chords. You can do a dominant chord leading to each of those chords. That's what a secondary dominant is. It's a dominant of a chord from the key. So for example, you could take the G7 chord and add a D7 that leads to it. There's D7 to G7. That's a secondary dominant. Now, you've already got a dominant of the tonic, so that doesn't have a secondary dominant. You don't commonly use a secondary dominant to go to the minor three chord, and the half diminished chord on the seventh scale degree isn't a key center as such. So that leaves four common secondary dominants. The five of two, the five of four, the five of five, and the five of six. That's the dominant chord five that leads to the chord on the second scale degree, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. In each case, 
the chord tones of each secondary dominant contain one note that isn't found in the home key. You can see these notes highlighted in red on the example. This is really important to know when you're improvising. If you want to sound like you know what you're doing, you need to hit that special note in your solos, the note that sticks out from the key. This way, your solos won't sound like you're in boring flat land the whole time. You'll hit that one spicy little note, not in the key, that makes your solo come alive. But <laughs> that's the trick, isn't it? <laughs> Hitting the right note at the right time. So that's the four common secondary dominants you'll come across. But today, we're just going to focus on one of them, and that's the five of five, the dominant of the dominant. That will be a dominant seven chord built on the second scale degree of the key you're in. If you're in C, there's C, that would be a D seven chord. When you know what to look for, you'll see this chord all over the place in all sorts of different songs. But off the top of my head, just thinking of jazz standards here, there's The Girl from Ipanema, Take the A Train, In a Mellow Tone, There'll Never Be Another You, and countless others. The chord is used as a kind of holding pattern, a delaying tactic in the harmonic rhythm when it's too soon in the chord progression to cadence home. Think of it like the harmonic equivalent of an aeroplane circling above an airport before getting clearance to land. So you don't want to land with the cadence yet, so you circle around and that secondary dominant just holds you there until you're ready. Very often you'll find this in bars 13 and 14 of the first 16 of standards. So let's talk about what you can play on this chord now when you're improvising. In a jazz context, it's common to use the Lydian dominant scale. That's the fourth mode of the melodic minor scale. Remember what I said earlier, you can go and check out my video on modes if this sounds like French to you. A Lydian dominant scale is like a major scale with a raised fourth and a flattened seventh. The raised fourth, or sharp 11, makes it Lydian in character, and the flattened seventh gives you the chord tones of a dominant seventh, hence the name Lydian dominant. So, if we're in C major, good old C major, the scale on the D7 chord, the D7 chord is the secondary dominant, the scale would be an A melodic minor starting on D. Oops, do that again. That's the sound. <laughs> really nice and spicy. Just before I tell you why this scale is so cool in this context, I should point out that in a jazz context at least, the five chord of the key is usually preceded by a two chord. This means that your secondary dominant will turn into a minor seven chord with the same root. So in C, your five of five, your secondary dominant is D7. This goes to D minor seven, then G7, and finally home to C. The reason, one of the reasons, that the Lydian dominant works so well in this context is that the sharp 11 and the 11th of the chord, there's the sharp 11, G sharp, there's the B, they create tension. And those two notes converge inwards to the fifth of the two chord. Going back to example in C, the G sharp and the B of D7, which is there, converge inwards like a pincer movement to the A of the D minor 7. G sharp and B go to the A of the D minor 7. Also, it sounds really good when you take the 5th, flat 7, 9, sharp 11, and 13, I haven't got enough fingers, of the secondary dominant chord and you arpeggiate them. On our D7 chord, that's A, C, E, G sharp, and B, forming an A minor major 9 arpeggio. That gives you this kind of sound. Really nice. But you don't have to use the Lydian dominant sound, of course. You can just as easily use the good old Mixolydian scale, and that works especially well in non-jazz settings. So there's C major, D, uh, D7 is your secondary dominant, and there's your Mixolydian scale. D, E, F sharp, G, A. C, no G sharp. Another option is to use the dominant bebop scale. And you can see both these scales in our example key 
on screen now. So the dominant bebop scale has the flattened seventh and the natural seventh. So it'd be D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, C sharp, D. That's the dominant bebop scale. That works really well. But the million dollar question is, what does this look like where the rubber hits the road when you're improvising? To answer that question, let's learn from the greats. Who else? And check out six examples of how to play of a secondary dominance. Here we go. Hey, quick back to the studio moment. <laughs> Just to remind you that there is that free PDF cheat sheet for a secondary dominance, which you can grab with the link that you can see there or click the link in the description. It's got all the uh, lessons and musical examples that you're learning about in today's show. So make sure that you grab that awesome free resource. Right, back to the lesson. Here we go. The first three examples are by Sonny Rollins and all of them are taken from the same solo on Toot Toot Tootsie, which is on his incredible album, The Sound of Sonny. Remember, all of these examples use the five of five secondary dominant. Here's what the first example sounds like. <laughs> This is a great example of the Lydian dominant with only one passing tone, the G natural at the end of the first D7 bar there. You can also see that Sonny emphasizes the A minor major arpeggio I was talking about. And this is a perfect example of the G sharp and B pincer movement closing in on the A of the D minor seven. Here's what the actual record sounds like. <laughs> A bit later in the same solo, Sonny even more clearly outlines the A minor major sound over the D7 secondary dominant. Check this out. It doesn't get much clearer than that. The only note missing from the complete five note arpeggio is the A. Of course, what really makes it so hip is the rhythm as well. Sonny was famous for those kooky, jagged rhythmic ideas. And this is a classic example of that. Interestingly, when he resolves onto the D minor seven this time, he goes to the 11th, the G natural. Here's what the original sounds like. <laughs> For the third example, we go towards the very end of this same song, and the whole song has modulated up a minor third to the key of E flat major for tenor. That makes the five of five an F13 sharp 11. Here we go. Once again, he's emphasizing that minor major sound. This time it's a C minor major nine over the F7 chord, super hip. When you hear the original, the piano player echoes it right back at him. Check this out. And actually it wouldn't be the worst idea in the world to play this and sing it loads of times until that sound goes into your ear and into your musical mind. Check this out, this is genius. <laughs> Right, moving on, the fourth example is by John Coltrane, taken from a song called Supposing, which is on a classic 1956 Miles Davis album called the new Miles Davis Quintet. This is one of those songs I mentioned earlier with the secondary dominant in bars 13 and 14 of the first 16. In tenor pitch, the key is C major, so nice and easy to see what's happening. Here's what he plays. This is another great Lydian dominant example, and you can see he links the important chord tones with chromatic notes. 
Just like Sonny, Train uses that A minor major arpeggio to form a pincer movement to converge on the fifth of the minor seven chord. Here's the original. <laughs> Final two examples are from Sunny State's incredible solo over on the sunny side of the street, taken from the famous Sunny Side Up album with Sunny Rollins and Dizzy Gillespie. That's the red one that you can usually see uh, in my background. It's a pretty slow tempo, but he doubles it for much of the solo, double time. Like Jaw Draw My Mind, the second chord of this song is actually a five of six secondary dominant, but the five of five secondary dominant we're interested in today comes in bar six. For tenor, we're in the key of D major, which makes that chord in E7. So uh, in concert pitch, we're in C, so that's D for tenor. So the five of five would be an E7 chord, which is D7 concert. Now, like I said, the second chord of this song is a five of six. So if, let's say we're in C major, for example, for a moment. There's your C. The five of six would be E7, which goes to chord six minor. So you might, you probably recognize that sound from Georgia. Georgia, Georgia, the whole day through, it does that thing. Um, but like I said, I'm, uh, I'm going off topic because we're concentrating on the five of five today. Here's what Sonny Stitt plays. There's that chromatic G approach note at the end of the first bar, then it's straight mixolydian scale for the E7. That's why I chose this phrase, because it shows you don't have to use the Lydian dominant. You can sit right on the standard mixolydian scale and it sounds great. But remember, he's still nailing the changes here because there's G sharps all over that E7 bar and we're in D major, talking in tenor pitch, of course. The G sharp isn't in a D major scale, so it sounds fresh and interesting when you pick out that note. Here's the original. <laughs> This last example, taken from the same solo, is a real winner. Sunny Stitt combines a bunch of harmonic and melodic techniques here and executes them so fast and flawlessly is jaw-dropping. <laughs> Remember, today we're focusing on what he plays on the E7 secondary dominant. That's the five of five. <laughs> Like I said, today we're focusing on the secondary dominant chord, but I can't not mention what he plays on the B minor seven here. This is a perfect example of using a line cliche. In this case, the line cliche is B to A sharp to A natural. He's picking out those notes on the B minor seven, resolving onto the G sharp of the E seven chord. Classic bebop, classic voice leading. Anyway, Getting back to the task in hand, <laughs> getting carried away. What Sunny Stitt does is to combine the Mixolydian scale and the Lydian dominant in the same bar. The first seven notes are Mixolydian, then he switches to Lydian dominant, and we start to see the sharp 11, that A sharp over the E7 chord come in. Like the Coltrane example, he plays with the root 13th and sharp 11, adding connecting chromatic notes. And like Rollins does in example two, he resolves onto the 11th of the minor seven chord. The lesson here is that if you keep doing this, you start to see common threads between all the different players. If you keep analyzing different players, the mists start to clear and you can start seeing and hearing how you can improvise on secondary dominance. That's what we really want to do here anyway. Here's the original recording for this example. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Now 
now that you know the theory, it's time to put all this stuff into practice, which is what really matters, of course. First of all, you need to be able to recognize a secondary dominant chord when it's staring you in the face. <laughs> in the case of the five of five secondary dominant we've been focusing on today, the key point is to look for a dominant seventh chord built on the second degree of the key that you're in. So in C, that would be D7. Could even be that. <laughs> in B flat, it would be C7 and so on. You get the idea. Then it's a question of making sure you can fluidly play the Mixolydian and Lydian dominant scales for all your seven chords. That's just hard graft, I'm afraid. <laughs> After that, you can work on picking out that minor major arpeggio I told you about earlier, that kind of sound. That's wicked. And transcribing great players to look for ideas on how to use it, like we just did. With enough work, you'll then be, begin to be able to improvise over that secondary dominant chord. That's what we're here for. And by the way, if you think all this sounds like a lot of hard work, it is. <laughs> That's why most people stick to some kind of one scale or pentatonic option when they improvise. There's nothing wrong with that. But blowing over chord changes is much more difficult and takes a lot more work, knowledge and experience. But hey, I believe in you, and if you can just take it one step at a time, and most importantly, get the basics down first, you'll get there. So, learn all your major melodic minor and harmonic minor scales. You can use the playlist linked above right now to do that, a perfect tool. Learn the chord tones for all the main chord types, and then keep transcribing solos and developing your ear. It's hard work, but you got this. I believe in you. I guess my final comment would be this. If you only play one note over a secondary dominant, make sure it's that sticky outy note I told you about earlier. If you do nothing else but hit that one note, those red notes you can see, your solos will sound drastically better straight away. So if you're in C and you've got the secondary dominant, uh, the five of six, which would be an E7, you pick out that G sharp. If you're in C and you're going to chord four, and you've got a C7, you pick out the B flat. If you've got a five of five, which is what we've been talking about today, which is a D7, you pick out that F sharp. And if you're doing the five of two, so if you're in C, there'll be an A7, you want to pick out that C sharp. Pick out that one note, that one spicy little note, and instantly you will rise above the crowd of other people. <laughs> So that's it for this week. Now, if your mind is blown from the information you've just seen, don't worry about it. It might just be slightly above your level. Make sure you check out those resources that I mentioned at the start, the uh, Harmony and Theory Zero to Hero playlist. That's got it all, really. That's got everything you need to take you from knowing nothing to uh, right up to these Lydian dominance and secondary dominance and all that really cool stuff. Hey, I forgot to mention in the video, actually, I'm using my Ven, Didario Ven 2.5 read at the moment, and uh, I'm loving it. So I hope it recorded okay. I think it sounds pretty good in the recording. Um, but first kind of um, synthetic read that I've really been tempted to go to full time. However, at some point, I'm going to get all the synthetic reads I can together and do a comparison between them and traditional cane. So I'm going to bring that to you at some point in the future. As always, if you've bought me a coffee, I thank you so much. There's been loads of people who buy me coffees and I appreciate it so much. Thank you very much. You can use the link there. Click the link in the description or there's a PayPal link that you can go straight to because buy me a coffee, stop using PayPal, which is a, which is a drag. Um, as always, you can get your free one hour saxophone success masterclass. And finally, one more time, just to remind you to go and get the free PDF cheat sheet for secondary dominance that you can grab using the link there. And as usual, the link in the description. Next week, I'm going to be back with more super cool stuff to um, improve your sax playing, make you a better musician and bring a bit more joy and happiness into your life. And until then, don't forget to practice hard, practice smart and Enjoy your music. Take it easy, guys. Players, there's six of them. Um, they lost it. Shiver me timbers. Shiver me dippers. Shiver me dippers. <laughs>